there's always well-intentioned people around you, Pierre, and you know this well from, mm -hmm. from your history. There's well-intentioned people, be it a, a spouse, a, a child, a, a relative, uh, a friend, uh, or, or actually the media, which will constantly give you, quote unquote, direction about what you should do, right? Here's what you should do. There's always these lists, right? To be successful, you have to follow this 10-point plan or this 8-point plan or more than that. This is Pierre Quinn, and you're listening to episode number 72 of the Leading Wild Green podcast, where my mission is to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. That was just a snippet of my conversation with author, speaker, and unconventional turnaround specialist, Rick Miller. Rick has worked with some of the top companies in the world, and in our conversation, we talk about his new book, Be Chief, and what he's doing to challenge the traditional definition of leadership. So, Listen up. It has definitely been a minute or two since I recorded a podcast intro like this. Normally, I'm coming to you from the comfort of my home and my microphone set up there, but I'm on the go. I'm on vacation, so I'm not supposed to be working, but I don't consider this podcast work. But I had to find a quiet ish quiet-ish space and use a portable setup. So that's why the sound sounds a little different than what we're used to. But anyway, I just want to thank all of you that support this podcast, whether I'm at home recording, I've done a couple of episodes from the backseat of my car when I was on vacation, or even here in the setup that I have now. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your five-star reviews on iTunes. Thank you for your shares on social media. All the things that you're doing to help me get the word about this podcast out and helping to support emerging leaders. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you haven't, hop over to iTunes and leave a five-star review and some comments. I would really, really appreciate it. So my guest today, Rick Miller, is an unconventional turnaround specialist, a servant leader, and a go-to chief. He is also an experienced and trusted confidant, an author, a sought-after speaker, and an expert at driving sustainable growth. He's worked with startups, he's worked with Fortune 10 and Fortune 30 companies, and in each case, he was recruited from the outside to turn around poor performance and difficult times. And in this conversation, we talk about his new book, Be Chief, and how an unlikely teacher has taught him some of leadership's greatest lessons. Listen up to my conversation with Rick Miller. Today I'm joined by Rick Miller, unconventional turnaround specialist, sought after speaker, servant leader, and author of the new book, Be Chief. It's a choice, not a title. Rick, thanks for joining me today. Great to be with you, Pierre. So Rick, take us back. Take our listening audience back to a time where you first felt like uh, leadership was going to be an important factor in your life. Well, you know, I, I, if you want to go back, let's go all the way back. I mean, I would go all the way back to growing up in central Massachusetts uh, with a wonderful father who was uh, actually in, in personnel back before there was human resources, Pierre. They, they called those folks personnel people. And uh, my dad was in personnel working in a manufacturing site uh, in central Massachusetts. And I grew up at the kitchen table, uh, listening to dad's stories about leaders and leadership and, and how it was important to connect people. And, and I would tell you, it all started there and in the many places I've been since, whether it was a business school undergrad or a graduate business degree or doing a lot of reading and a lot of experiences from startups to multinationals, I would tell you, honestly, I've learned a lot of lessons or maybe relearned a lot of lessons, but uh, they're frankly the lessons that, that dad taught me. Uh, all those years back. So uh, I was grateful for that experience. And it's amazing how simple simple things can be if you kind of boil them all down to, to people and relationships and, and the golden rule and some things that we just need to be reminded about. So what was it about growing up, hearing those stories uh, from your dad or maybe some things that happened in high school that led you in the direction of, of going into business and, and having your career in that discipline? Well, you know, I, I chose business. You know, Dad, again, was in personnel, but I, I learned early on that, uh, that people in personnel didn't make a lot of money. And, uh, <laughs> if they did, I probably would have been in human resources, but uh, uh, not great food, but we had food on the table. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a challenging situation for my dad. My, my mom was uh, hospitalized most of my youth. So dad, as a single parent, uh, for all intents and purposes, brought us up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wanted more. Uh, I wanted more. I, I went to business school and, and wanted to be a uh, uh, a successful business person and 
and and dad taught me uh, at the kitchen table it's all about teams now in uh, in high school sports and college sports where i played um, it was all about team success and it was that team success that that led me to a, a sales uh, career uh, early on into general management and turnaround management beyond that but but it it did go back to teams it talked about uh, uh, again how do you connect people how do you make people feel good about their role on the team and and helping them grow to be the best version of themselves so whether it was on a a soccer field and, and high school and college or a, a sales team right out of a business school or, or later on running a, a, a branches and divisions and whole companies, uh, those central lessons uh, always fit. Let, let's chat a little bit about maybe overcoming adversity and challenges growing up, uh, having a mother who was hospitalized, dad, uh, feeling moving like a, a single parent. Uh, what, what's your advice to, especially those of us who are younger in our careers, when they face challenging situations, hardships? I mean, to look at you in your in your career now, we might not be able to tell that that's part of your backstory. But what are some lessons you learned from that experience growing up that really that really helped you become the the b- become intentional the way that you are today? Well, yeah, I, I think I, I, I think the central part of, of again what Dad taught and, and what I did learn uh, was was at, at times you've got to develop the ability to to listen to your own voice. Uh, there's always well-intentioned people around you, Pierre, and you know this well from, mm-hmm. from your history. There's well-intentioned people, be it a, a spouse, a, a child, a, a relative, uh, a friend, uh, or, or actually the media, which will constantly give you quote unquote, direction about what you should do, right? Here's what you should do. There's always these lists, right? To be successful, you have to follow this 10 point plan or this eight point plan or more than that. Um, And what I found early on was really the ability to develop my own voice uh, and understand that my own voice, while I get input from everybody else, it's my own voice that matters. And I think that led to to, uh, my development of a what I now call a compass. A compass is something that you look to for direction. Uh, but the core of your compass, uh, kind of what you use to make decisions, is based on your own self-understanding. I mean, you and I, Pierre, are different, as is every member of your of your audience. Everybody's mm-hmm. different. Mm-hmm. And, and we all have different voices. We can be influenced by similar outside factors. But but the key was really to develop that, that inner voice. And, and that inner voice, Dad taught me, uh, to to develop, but really in five areas, he said, you know what? If you really want to develop that inner voice, it's it's about being present. It's about knowing where you are right now, not worrying about what's going to happen next week or next month, or or frankly, what happened a day ago or a week ago. But being present, uh, number one. Number two, uh, being accepting, accepting mm-hmm. of the situation as it is. Don't lose a lot of energy by by trying to fight what is. You can fight for the future, mm-hmm. but what what is is, and you can't change what is. So just be accepting. He taught me to be generous and to be grateful. And then also, fifth, to, to find time to be still. And it was really important that amongst all the noise that happens all around us, to find some time to be still, whether it's walking in nature or some people are meditators, I happen to be, or just finding a quiet place where you can kind of kind of zone out a little bit and, 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 and get yourself out of all the noise. So, so I would ask answer your, your, your question somewhat with a long answer, but an important one. Uh, no matter where you go, it's important to develop your own voice, uh, to develop your your self understanding and the energy that that comes from that, as opposed to maybe the energy that people think they get from having that second cup of coffee or a little more Mountain Dew or a little mm-hmm. five hour energy. Uh, mm-hmm. The energy the energy that comes from inside is the thing that'll sustain you uh, throughout w- throughout whatever journey you take. Now these are uh, principles that you teach high level executives and you've been teaching them for years. Now help us out on on this podcast with a little bit of education. Uh what when terms like Fortune 50, Fortune 500, Fortune 250. What do those terms mean and what has your role been with companies under that categoriz- categorization? Well, you know the the uh, the business world where I where I practice my uh, my skills, if you will, or my practice uh, what I've been given primarily um, is 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 segmented, right? There are there are startups, there are entrepreneurs, by the way, who have uh, you know a company of one. There are startups with small uh, smaller numbers of people. You get mid sized companies, and then uh, you know I guess Fortune uh, was was successful in branding uh, uh, their their lists, if you will. So the, mm-hmm. the Fortune one hundred is the 100 largest companies 
uh, in the world. Uh, Fortune 50, the largest 50 in the world. Fortune 500, the largest 500 in the world. And, and Fortune is the brand that, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's used to define size. And yes, I've, I've played a role, frankly, across all of it. I've, I've, uh, uh, the title that I, I, I've been given more often than not is, is Unconventional Turnaround Specialist. So generally what that means is that I have a kind of a little bit of a different approach uh, but as a turnaround specialist, I'm basically called my phone rings when things are going south. Hmm. Right? When a company has tried almost everything else and they said, you know what, we need outside help. So on the small end of the spectrum at a startup, uh, I, I was uh, my phone rang and I was hired at one point to be the uh, a board member and the president and chief operating officer of an internet startup. Had less than a million dollars in revenue and was struggling. Uh, in a bad way during a down market, and they really wanted to go public. Well, that was one set of circumstances. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, a company that's probably more known to people would be a company like AT&T, which at the time I was recruited into AT&T, they were a Fortune 10 company, one of the 10 largest companies mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And I was their first outside recruit in their 100-year history to run uh, a division, not as a staff position, but in a line position, uh, as an officer of the company. So whether it's small stuff or, or big stuff, I've had some experience in both. And uh, I would tell you that what's common, uh, whether it's the smallest of companies or the biggest of companies, uh, are, are some of the lessons that dad taught me at the kitchen table. Mm. And, and those are the things that, that you and I'll talk about today, which are the choices that people can make uh, to be more powerful themselves and to build powerful organizations. Well, the, 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 the title of your book is Be Chief, and the subtitle is It's a Choice, uh, Not a Title. How does your book speak to the traditional or conventional perspective on, on leadership? And because, because you kind of turn this idea, the, the conventional definition of leadership, on its ear. Well, I try to. I, I try to. The uh, you know, leadership uh, you know, used to be about level, and now it's about state of mind. Uh, you know, the term chief in itself is interesting to people uh, as, I, as I talk to people into groups uh, because they're not interested in the term chief, Pierre, as much as they are the power associated with the word chief. Mm -hmm. So power is an important word. And the, and the conventional view of power, I would say uh, the older view of power that I'm not sure serves us today, is that power was about authority and power was about control and that power came from things like position and titles, titles like chief. Uh, and that was an older view of power where today organizations that are succeeding understand that power needs to be redefined. Power today is about energy and clarity and confidence. And with energy, clarity, and confidence, people ha really do have influence and they can have an impact. And unlike the old definition of, of power, authority, or control, which was limited to someone who had a title, chief executive officer, chief financial officer. Today's version of power, energy, clarity, confidence, influence, and impact are things that even someone on the front line, somebody on an organization chart who's at the very bottom, mm -hmm. can, can show up every day with, with, with energy, clarity, and confidence and have influence in their organization and have an impact far beyond maybe their title would show. So I think that's, what, that's really what the book is about. And frankly, that's what I've done. Uh, working with great teams of people from startups to multinationals is how do you unlock that power? How do you how do you create environments where everyone brings their A game to work every day? And guess what? When they do, that's when things get turned around. And and that's probably why I've been described as a bit of an unconventional turnaround specialist. So you you make the assertion uh, in your book that part of being chief at all levels is is bringing a bit more of your personal life and personal experience into the workplace. Now, conventionally, we, we talk about work-life balance and, you know, there's a pod for work and there's a pod for home and never the twain shall meet. But, but you speak to something different. Well, I think, I think the question, uh, honestly, at one point may have made sense. I don't think it does anymore, much like the definition of power has evolved to something mm -hmm. new. I think, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe we were talking about work-life balance. But to me, the right question is, how is your work-life integration going, right? Mm -hmm. Balance indicates a separation. And by the way, if you think about balance, when I think about balance, I think about the scales of justice, 
right? Yeah. That are, you know, one, one pod on one side, one on the other. And the only time, Pierre, that they're ever balanced is when they are perfectly still, right? And is your life ever perfectly still? Mine's not. <laughs> and I would imagine for your listeners, nobody's life is ever personally balanced. So I think that's that's a misnomer because in, in that way, you're never still, which means you're always failing. You're never quite at a perfect balance. Integration, I think, when I, when I talk to the people uh, in, in organizations that I have the privilege of working with, we talk about work-life integration. How does work and life integrate together? Because with our smartphones, you know, you, you, you can be a notification away on a Saturday or a Sunday. What, what used to be viewed as, okay, those were your personal days where mm-hmm. Monday through Friday were your work days. Well, guess what? Life, life comes in seven days a week and work sometimes comes in seven days a week. Um, and the question is, how do you integrate it in a healthy way? So, yes, you certainly do need to take time for family and friends and community service and, and those elements that, that, that make all of us who we are. Um, but to have a strict, you know, uh, this is a business uh, a day and this is a personal day, that just doesn't seem to be reality for a lot of people. So how can you integrate that in a healthy way uh, and move the ball forward on all fronts? Speaking of uh, integration, let's go back and for a bit and talk about the, the compass you referenced earlier in our conversation, the power com- compass and the, the necessity, especially as emerging leaders, to be able to evaluate and then bring together our values, our insight, our creativity, our discipline, and our support? And how, how can we maximize that to be more of a chief? Well, that's a great, a great question. And before I answer it, let me, let me do this. You and I today are talking about a book. And I am very excited about the book. And I hope that many people uh, who are listening uh, uh, go buy a, a copy of, or many copies of uh, Be Chief. It's a choice, not a title. Uh, number one, because it's a great book. Number two, because it'll, it'll, it'll help you and the people around you. But number three, because all proceeds are going to help special needs kids. So that's an important point uh, mm-hmm. that I want to get out there. At the same time, the idea of this power compass, and if you're interested in the power compass, I want your listeners to know that you can actually take the power compass online in about three to five minutes for free. Go to beingchief.com, my website. It's right there. It's free It'll, in your smartphone, three to five minutes, and you'll actually get a score. A, you know, the language of business, Pierre, I believe is numbers, right? The language of business is numbers. So if it's important, you want to measure it. Mm-hmm. So in the power compass, in those areas that you just laid out, we actually allow you to get a, a score, a discipline score that will very much link to your clarity. If you want to increase your clarity, you'll have specific ways to increase your clarity. Uh, influence, which is linked to support. Specific, you'll get a score for influence and, and a way to increase it. Similar for energy, confidence, and impact, and that's how we define power. So I just want your listeners to have that, to know that it's free and they can do it at any point. Uh, obviously, if they're, they're hooked, they really want to understand how to apply this. The book is a wonderful follow-on and it will help special needs kids. So I wanted to get that out there because we're, we're, all, try, we're all about service and uh, the project is about service and obviously the the benefits of, of book sales will go to the special needs kids. But to get to your point specifically, uh, if you are a, 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 a green leader, I mean, I'm a fan of, of your book, Leading While Green, Pierre, and, and we can lead at any level, right? So if you're a green leader, if you're a new leader, um, it's still important to connect what you do to who you are. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the energy we talked about earlier that comes from self-understanding is actually very much connected to the confidence that you will increase as you better understand your values. So the key to being a chief is really to, to start with who am I and what are my values and using that as the core of your compass, then you can go out and be in a disciplined way, supporting other people and fully manifesting the future with your creativity uh, to maximize your impact. So those are how the pieces fit together. And it really is about starting with your self understanding and your values and that from that center, moving out to influence other with clarity and maximizing your impact. But let's talk a little bit about the decision to have the, the proceeds from the book benefit special needs and what your experience volunteering with someone uh, with special needs taught you about the, the principles that you espouse in your book about being chief. Oh, well, thank you for that question. It's uh, it's, it's, uh, it's my favorite question to answer, and obviously you've read up on it. You already know, and your listeners will know right now about a wonderful six-year-old girl named Melissa 
who was uh, one of my greatest teachers and frankly, in every way, shape and form, one of the most powerful chiefs I've ever met. I was uh, working, volunteering at a rehabilitation hospital uh, in northern New Jersey, working in a 100 degree heated pool with a trained physical therapist working uh, for afternoons for months and months with wonderful kids who had uh, uh, issues like Melissa, who had cerebral palsy. Um, when I first met Melissa, when I first saw Melissa, I was in the pool working with, a, with another young person, but I was struck by watching Melissa come being wheeled into the, to the pool area uh, by an attendant. And what instantly struck me about Melissa was the reaction of the rest of the staff who weren't in the pool to Melissa. They, they all went over to her and, and, and obviously she had made an impact. This was my first day. Uh, working with the with the rehab specialist, but obviously Melissa had been there before. But I was struck first by by the reaction that she got from everybody around her. And then when they left, she sat quietly in her wheelchair and in a very serene, uh, almost accepting way. She was just kind of looking at what was going on, taking it all in. Yet when we got her in the pool, she was as active and as focused as anybody I'd ever worked with. She mm. was she was a very hardworking young lady. Uh, at the same time. She was very generous with her smile. She was happy to be there. And she always showed gratitude at the end. She, was, she would always say thank you to the physical therapist and me. Um, and, and so when I think about Melissa, I think about a girl. By the way, she had a goal. When we first started working with her, she had clenched fists and they were up by her shoulders. Her dream was to fully extend both arms, to grab a little Nerf basketball, and put it in a floating net and score two points like a yeah. basketball player. It took us six months. That first day, by the way, we only moved one arm about three inches. She was so tight. And even in the 100-degree heated pool, we had to gently and slowly try to extend her, her limbs. Six months later, she was able to actually grab that, that basketball, that, that Nerf ball, and drop it in. And you, I can still I get goosebumps when I tell the story because I can still hear the boom of reaction of all the staff members who knew that she was getting closer to her goal. So when I think about a chief Pierre, I think about someone who is accepting, someone who works hard, who is present and generous and grateful, and someone who who impacts others. And I'll tell you what, I I uh, I was so impressed by Melissa and what she taught me, what she reminded me that I decided when I uh, was going through this book project and we, and we hit the published data a couple of weeks ago, um, it just seemed like a, a, perfect, uh, a, a perfect scenario to donate all author proceeds to, uh, to, to help special needs kids like Melissa. And I'm, I'm delighted, by the way, on, on Amazon in the first week, we gained uh, a number one status in two categories. The book was number one, the number one new release in both uh, uh, leadership training and business management in the first week at Amazon. So mm. it's gotten off to a great start. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, karma is a wonderful thing. Uh, and I believe that uh, putting all proceeds to help special needs kids says this project has some tailwinds. Mm. Uh, maybe some would say divine tailwinds, but uh, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a book that helps people, uh, both those that buy it and obviously the special needs kids who will benefit from the money. I want to uh, unpack this just a little bit more as it relates to Melissa being one of your greatest teachers and what and the nest the necessity of leaders to be open, because I'm guessing and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm guessing y you didn't go into that volunteering scenario thinking that Melissa was going to be one of your greatest teachers. So speak to the, ne the necessity of leaders. And this goes to the core of being the, the book be, be chief, the necessity of leaders. Uh, willingness to learn uh, even across disciplines, across the organization, or even in spaces where they don't think they could possibly learn anything. Oh, it's a great point, Pierre. Thank you for bringing it out. Because in fact, uh, all chiefs uh, at all levels really are student teachers. I have yet to meet someone who did not have something to teach me. It didn't matter. And clearly in this example, I thought I was going to be offering help when in fact, yes, I probably offered some help to the physical therapist and to Melissa, but what I gained, right, what I learned was so much in my mind more powerful. Now, it's all based on our perspectives, mm -hmm. but any, any situation you go into, uh, the book is, is full of stories where someone who thinks they are there to serve are actually being served. 
And it's an understanding that uh, you can be a, a player coach or, or more accurately, a student teacher, because you can think you're there to teach when, in fact, you're there to, to be the student at the same time. And I think that's where, where teams really do unlock their power when everyone steps up to the fact that, yes, I can be mentored in certain areas. Everybody can get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but everybody can play that teacher role at the same time, right? And, and to, to bring your full selves to every situation, we all have something to teach and, and we all have lots to learn. Can you, can you give us an example? And we know you'll have to, to leave off the name or, or the title of the organization, but can you give us a, a, an example of when you tried to teach this principle to maybe some C-suite leaders and you got pushed back but eventually they embraced it and it, and it really transformed the organization. Well, I would tell you, honestly, I do not get a lot of pushback Mm. from from people in the corner office. And I know that there are plenty of stories and I think they're dated um, about, uh, you know, authoritarian leaders who, who uh, uh, are in the corner office and, and got to the corner office solely as a result of their hard work. I mean, I, I've got, a, uh, I've got a, an aversion to one particular term. Whenever I, heard the term, whenever I hear the term self-made man, <laughs> yeah. self-made woman, yeah. I, think, I think to myself, number one, it's generally written by someone about somebody else, right, as a way of, of, of uh, celebrating their accomplishments. But I have yet to meet anyone in a senior leader as a senior leader who believes they are quote unquote self-made themselves. Mm-hmm. Everyone's going to recognize a teacher. Everyone's going to recognize just the, the benefit of, you know, where they were born, uh, the, 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 the opportunities that were given to them. Um, you know, so, so I got to tell you, there's, there, I know that there is, there's certainly uh, individuals who, who are viewed by many as saying, wow, perhaps they don't reach out as much as they could. And I think that stylistically, but when I get a chance to to sit down with people, certainly the people that I work with, um, they are uh, they are willing to acknowledge very very easily that they are there as a result of hard work always, and good luck always as well. Say we're we're at a conference, we're at a seminar, workshop, training session, and in our audience are first year business students, uh, interns. Uh, first year account executives fresh out of college, this new group of leaders, and you're closing up your keynote uh, on being chief and the power of influence and leadership. What do you say to this group who, who, who they've had a hard life, hard education, hard family experience, and they don't quite know if they're ready for these responsibilities that they're embracing? How, how do you finish off a keynote presentation to them? Well, it's, it's a great question, and it really does go to the heart of, of what the book is all about because, you know, it, it's what can you control and what can't you? Early in any career, you're looking to build up new experiences and to expand relationships, right? Experiences and relationships, relationships and experiences. And, and, and if you're talking about a, a group of people who have, are interns or are new to business, obviously, they've, they've gotten that first job. But even to people who are in college who are trying to get that first job. The, the, the close is the opening is the middle. It's about your choices hmm. around your clarity and your energy and your confidence. What are you doing, right, as you work through new experiences with new people to display clarity, energy, and confidence? And realizing that when you support other people, that's where you gain influence, right? People think, well, that person is pretty influential. Well, you know, uh, today we're actually, you know, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we're celebrating uh, the, uh, the passing of our 41st president, right? And, and George H.W. Bush, uh, the stories that are being told to be very current are about the influence that he had around the world and the, the calls that he made to support other people are now the stuff of legend as they're being, mm-hmm. stories are being told and told and told. And what kind of impact? Does a quiet leader like that, granted, a president of the United States, is that really a quiet position? Mm-hmm. But, but, but people are talking about today the humility that the man brought to the office. And so certainly energy is being described as work ethic. I mean, he had his son, uh, the 43rd president, described him as having uh, really two speeds, right? All out and asleep. Right? <laughs> Those were his two speeds. So high energy, high clarity, high morals, high confidence. 
and the influence and impact that came from that. Again, just a topical because it's so much in the news as we're talking today. Uh, but that's the story, actually, to that to that closing keynote uh, audience. Uh, those are the things that matter. Those are the things that you can control. There's lots you can't control, but there's many things you can. So you know, do your best with what you can control. Uh, use tools like the Power Compass. Rely on 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 your intuition. Uh, focus on your uh, self understanding and your values, and it will always serve you well. This segment of the podcast, I like to call shameless plug time. So, so Rick, give us, how can we reach you? Underscore the power compass for us again. How do we get a copy of the book, social media? Give, give it all to open up the fire hose and give it all to us. Well, it's real simple, Pierre. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity. The, the name of the company is Being Chief, B-E-I-N-G-C-H-I-E-F. And Being Chief, you can find on Facebook. Being Chief, you can find on Twitter. Being Chief, you can find on LinkedIn all those elements. So uh, the website, surprise, surprise, is beingchief.com. For those that, and by the way, on the beingchief.com website, you'll see a page that's dedicated to the book. And if you have trouble, if being chief is too long for you, just go to bechief.com because either, either one will get you there. And if you go to either, you'll get a couple things. You'll have an opportunity to download a free copy. Uh, it should be a free chapter of the book if you want to dip your toe in first. You'll get a link to take the power compass for free. You'll, get a, uh, you'll see information on uh, the nonprofit that's getting the special needs nonprofit that's getting all author proceeds to the book. You'll get a sense of all the endorsements that, uh, that have been coming in about the book. By the way, on Amazon, I think you know, a bunch of people have said what they think about the book. You'll be able to, to connect into that too. So lots of places to look. My guest on this episode has been unconventional turnaround specialist, speaker, leader, and author of Be Chief. It's a choice, not a title. Rick Miller. Rick, thanks for joining us. I know I've benefited from our conversation and I know our audience will too. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Pierre. Rich conversation with Rick Miller about his personal leadership journey and about how the definition of leadership has really changed, at least in Rick's view, it's changed, and what the culture needs from today's leaders at all levels. I wanna encourage you to hop over to beingchief.com to check out Rick's work and, and also check out the free Power Compass survey. It's a great tool, I've taken it. It's a great assessment and you can use it to set some goals as we're transitioning from one year to the next. Speaking of transitioning from one year to the next, I know that you've taken the free course, right? 12 Ways to Grow as a Leader. That's on my website, PRCQuinn.com. I know you've taken it, right? It's another free resource for you. Make sure you access it so that you and your team can grow. I also want to encourage you to check out my signature leadership course, my Leading While Green Intensive and tons of rich video content, great stuff, stuff that I've been using to mobilize and synergize and teach teams across the country. You're getting it at a significant break and I want you to get your hands on it as you look to transition your team from 2018 to 2019. All right, that's all I got for this episode of the Leading While Green podcast. You know it's my mission to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. So until next time, take care and God bless.